and be the first of many that we intend to have in South Africa. I would like to invite now Dr. Lawrence Banks, is the ICGB Director General, to say a few words of welcoming you guys. Thank you, Lewis. Uh, really, just a very warm welcome to everybody, and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, it's really great to see so many people here in the room in person, but I also know there's also many, many more joining us online, so really a very warm welcome. This is a really uh, fantastic evening for ICGB. Uh, we've been running this science outreach program where we bring the excitement about science to the general public. Uh, we've been doing this in Trieste now for, for many years, but this is the first occasion that we're moving it out of Italy, and I can't think of a better place in which to do it here in the wonderful city of Cape Town and this amazing building, it's fantastic. And of course, within South Africa, uh, we really intend this to be now the start of a, an event which we will move around the country and hopefully also expand to other parts of the continent. So again, thank you so much. And, and finally, I would just like to say, I think it's also very appropriate, the subject of what we're going to be discussing tonight fact and fake. I think in the period of the pandemic and as we move into the post-pandemic, there has been so much misinformation out there and we have a fantastic team here tonight who will tell us a little bit about how we can really try to figure out what is the real thing, what the real news is, what the real information is, because that's what science is all about, searching for the truth. So thank you all again for being here. And a really big thank you to my partner in crime here, Dr. Nalala Mamsomi, who's the president of BioAfrica, and he also represents South Africa on the ICGB Board of Governors. And so I'll hand the floor to him and thank him again for, for taking charge tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, Louise. And welcome, everybody, to tonight's session of the Science and the City. And a special welcome to our Director General from the Department of Science and Innovation, Dr. Fiorum Joachar. Um, my first job for tonight, I suppose, is to introduce uh, our esteemed panel um, that is sitting here with me, and two of the panelists are sitting in um, different parts of the country, uh, Pretoria and Devon, as I understand. Uh, I will start with the uh, people that are present here. On my left hand side is Dr. Lara Donaldson, who is going to be the first uh, panelist uh, in tonight's um, session. Uh, the second panelist is going to be Professor Musa Mashabela, uh, who is also sitting with me. They are number one and two mainly because they made an effort to pitch in Cape Town. <laughs> so that's how they become rewarded. And the next um, panelist, number three and four, uh, professors um, um, David Paho, who is sitting in Devon, as well as Dr. Rasigan Maharaj. I suppose the topic or the title of today's discussion uh, speaks for itself. There's been a lot of misinformation, and it becomes clear to us mainly because of the accessibility of new forms of media and information dissemination. Um, but if we understand history, we do know that misinformation about science has been with us for as long as science has been with us. And we've asked the panelists today to try and anchor their discourse on two um, seminar works. One is by Thomas Kuhn, which speaks to the history of scientific enterprise, the structure of scientific revolutions. And more importantly, when we say that this phenomenon has been with us for as long as humanity has practiced science in a method that is uh, structured, we remember um, the heliocentric view of the world that was preceded by the world, uh, or rather the earth, uh, 
um, um, the sun revolving around the earth and how for a very long time the idea that the sun was the center of our universe was considered uh, taboo, was not scientific, and certainly a lot of scientists suffered in the hands of those who controlled the discourse or controlled what constituted facts. So when we speak about misinformation, we should not make the mistake of thinking this is a new phenomenon. It has been around for as long as humanity existed and practiced the scientific uh, process. The second seminal work that we requested um, our panelists to anchor their um, discourse around was manufacturing consent. Because in understanding how the Copernican revolution as well as the um, final triumph of science uh, through Galileo's um, uh, discoveries. Um, we also need to understand who controls the narrative, who controls the narrative, and that's why we requested Chomsky's work on manufacturing consent um, to be considered as part of this discourse. And importantly, manufacturing consent talks to how the truth or how information and how the facts are packaged in the interest of those who are elites in society who control the means of dissemination. And so facts is facts, it's not gonna change. Scientific facts is not gonna change. However, what gets to society does get um, um, edited or edited out or some modification. So that was the second part of our, of our, of our um, anchoring this discussion tonight. And particularly because we also want to explore whether um, when we talk about misinformation, we don't commit the error of becoming unscientific in analyzing what leads to this misinformation. Whether human beings are being irrational by being, for example, anti-vaxxers. We are um, going to be straight because we're biotechnologists and we understand that an anti-vaxxer is a negative tendency or trend. Or anti-GMO, we understand that that's a negative tendency, of it, but is that an irrational response to the scientific enterprise? And, and, and that's part of the conversation that we hope to have tonight. How do we contextualize that to the populations of the South? We certainly know that the history of science has not been blameless. There's been a lot of abuses of the scientific process throughout the period of um, humanity's existence and practice of science. Uh, we start by acknowledging that the mistrust of human beings or society of science is not unreasonable. Um, as I've said, that there's plenty of abuses that you will find littered in the records of history. These are documented. We also accept that Norms, Chomsky, what Chomsky is actually saying, or may really be saying about science and about the manufacturing of concern by elites in our current context, uh, meaning who captures the agenda and therefore captures what type of science gets to be done. Um, for whose benefit means that it's not just science that benefits all of society in an even manner as truth or as facts or as science should, but it's an instrument to perpetuate economic and political agendas of the elites. And I think in today's world, when we look at COVID, which is the reason why we've um, gathered today because We've seen the explosion and the development of what is an infodemic uh, of these misrepresentations um, of science um, during the COVID uh, pandemic. We ask ourselves questions of why it took less than three years to have five, six, or five to 10 vaccines for COVID when 41 years after HIV was discovered, there is no vaccine for HIV. And that's something that we need to ponder within the context of what we are here um, today about. Um, we also want to ask questions, and I'm sorry 
to throw you um, under the bus, um, Lara. Um, um, we want to ask a question around why there is an uneven distribution of the dividends of science where GMOs are concerned. Why we still have food insecurity in a world where plant power technology ought to deliver equal dividends across the entire globe. And that, those are some of the issues that we want to, to, to ask. And I want to close, more importantly, by acknowledging the collaboration between at least my organization, um, now I'm jumping off uh, ICGP, <laughs> BioAfrica, as well as um, an ICGP, uh, the promise that the partnership of organizations like ours and ICGP um, shows to the world the promise of collaboration between progressives in pursuit of the even distribution and an even uh, benefits of science to all of humanity. And I want to hand over now to our esteemed panelists, starting with um, um, Lara, uh, who is a plant biotechnologist. I promise you I've not seen your presentation. So please surprise us and wow us. And as I said, I'll revert back to next, which is what my real job is. <laughs> I'm gonna, oh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, we're here to talk about fake news. So what is fake news? It's purposefully crafted, sensational, misleading, or totally fabricated information that looks like real news. And as Dr. Msomi said, it, Fake news has been around for as long as news has. Um, the only difference today is that it can spread, spread like wildfire because of social media. And I think it's worth just acknowledging the role that we play in this and that we all have a responsibility to think before we share. Fake news um, is harmful, obviously, because it creates anxiety, it undermines our trust in our national authorities, um, and it affects public, uh, the willingness to comply with public health recommendations as we've seen in the COVID-19 pandemic. So what can we do about it? Well, several things. So when we're confronted with what we suspect might be fake news, we can stop and fact check. Um, we can try and debunk, debunk some of the myths that are caused by fake news. We can also, there's also other tools so we can try and preempt fake news and there's some learning tools around that help us to spot the techniques used to create fake news. But I think tonight we really need to focus on the first two, fact checking and debunking, because here science can really play a role. And the reason for that is because science is fact based. Um, so as a scientist, I perform experiments, and when I want to go to publish my results, they're subjected to a really rigorous peer review process. So a panel of my peers will then check to see that my experiments are repeatable, that my data is statistically significant, um, and, that the and that the conclusions that I draw are sound. So scientific journal articles present a credible source of information that we can use to fact check, but they're not very easy to read. Um, so that's why outreach events like tonight are so important. Um, so I'm a plant scientist, so um, I'm gonna be talking about GMO foods. So let's start with what the scientist says. So, 25 years of research and more than 3,000 scientific publications support the safety of GMO crops. More than 280 scientific institutions endorse the safety of GMO crops. Oh, my green's very bright, but I'll read to you um, just a statement from one of these institutions, the Royal Society. It says, foods derived from GM crops have been consumed by hundreds of millions of people across the world for more than 15 years with no reported ill effects or legal cases related to human health, despite many of the consumers being in that most litigious of countries, the USA. So in 2016, more than 150 of the world's leading scientists wrote a letter to um, the leaders of the world, you can find this online, and it's basically asking them to revise their anti-GM policies and to allow um, the use of GM crops, particularly golden rice. And their last, I'm just gonna highlight the last line of their letter, which says, how many more people in the, poor people in the world must die before we consider this a crime against humanity? Okay, so the scientists say it's safe. So what do the public think? 
Um, these are results from a worldwide survey conducted by the Pew Research Institute that showed that only 13% of the public think that GM foods are safe. So why this massive disparity between what the scientists say and what the public think? And has fake news played a role? So I'll ask you if any of you have ever seen images like this or this. Awesome. Ever heard of the term Frankenfood? So I find this last image particularly disturbing. It shows some evil scientists that have created genetically modified maize and the people that are eating it are turning into zombies. So in this country, we've been eating genetically modified maize for 20 years. Um, I haven't seen anyone that looks like that. So what have the impacts been? Um, so this paper basically showed that by um, growing GM maize and the increased yields that we've achieved by doing that, have created welfare benefits to the tune of 700 million US dollars um, and an additional 4.6 million rations, maize rations on the table each year. To have achieved the same with conventional varieties, we would have had to plant up to an additional 217,000 hectares of land with an environmental damage cost of almost 300,000 US dollars a year. So clearly there's been a positive impact but people are still strongly anti-GM food. They protest, they destroy field trials, why? So I've spent some time in the last few weeks trying to understand the myths around GM foods and I think it boils down to three main ideas, all of which are flawed. So basically that GM foods are unnatural, they're somehow harmful, and that by adopting GM technologies, we're gonna allow for corporate takeover of our food systems. So let's look at them a bit further. So, um, the idea that GM foods are unnatural, and I'm gonna ask the question, well, what foods that we eat are natural? So almost all the fruits and veggies we consume today have been genetically modified in some way. Um, so I don't know if you can see the pointer. So this is the ancestor of maize. It's called Tiacinte. Um, it's got a really tiny kernel. It's surrounded in this really hard outer casing that makes it virtually inedible. And thousands of years of selective breeding have given us the maize that we eat today. Broccoli you won't find growing in the wild. Its ancestral plant is wild cabbage and it's been artificially selected for many different traits to give us lots of the veggies we eat today. So they're all down here. This is a picture of watermelon from the 1600s. Bananas have been bred to the point where they no longer make seeds, which means that every new banana plant has to be propagated from a seedling and is an identical clone of its parent, making this population really susceptible to disease. Ruby grapefruits, completely man-made. How did we do it? You took a yellow grapefruit, you expose it to either nasty um, mutagenic chemicals or to ionizing radiation that induces hundreds of unknown mutations. Um, and the, one of them happened to make the grapefruit pink and sweeter, and now that's our preferred variety today. So all of these foods are genetically modified, but they're considered natural and they're considered safe, so what warrants that GMO label? Basically, it's the technology that was used to create it. And GMO crops, it, what that means is basically that GMO crops contain a tiny little piece of extra DNA. Um, oops, how do we do that? We use a natural plant pathogen called agrobacterium. And this guy normally transfers a little bit of DNA to the plant, and it does that to get the plant to make food for it, which results in these crown gall um, tumors. So instead of getting the agrobacterium to transfer its DNA, we get it to transfer a gene that's gonna give the plant some advantage. And normally this is either a herbicide resistance gene or a gene that's borrowed from another bacterium called Bacillus thuringiensis, or Bt, that gives the plant um, resistance to insect pests. And it's really this idea of taking DNA from one organism to another organism that might seem wrong to some people. And I found this really great paper that sort of explores um, why intuitively maybe some people might find it wrong and how GM, anti-GM campaigns really play on people's intuitions against their reason. I don't have time to go into it, but happy to pick up on it later if you want. So the second myth was that GM crops are, are harmful. So I think I made the point earlier that 
Um, the GM crops have been shown to be safe for human consumption. Uh, what about the environment? Um, so particularly those uh, crops that have been engineered to have the BT gene, which gives them insect resistance, that, B, that BT gene doesn't target bees and butterflies, as you might have heard. And actually, by having that gene in the plant, it means that we spray less with pesticides and insecticides, and it's actually far less harmful for the environment. The last idea is this corporate capture of our food systems and the poor farmers that are going to have to buy the seed and buy the chemicals to invest in this technology. And I would argue that the same applies to any superior or commercial um, seed variety. And farmers invest in this technology because it's advantageous to them. So particularly herbicide resistance or round, Roundup Ready crops, farmers buy these seeds because it means that they don't have to till the land. They can basically just spray with the herbicide to get rid of the weeds before they want to plant their crop. Tilling's really bad because it rips up all the topsoil and releases all this locked carbon into the atmosphere. It also means that they can plant their crops much closer together so they get much greater yield off the same amount of land. And actually a recent paper in Trends in Plant Science from last month showed that if Europe would adopt current GM technologies, they would reduce their carbon emissions from agriculture by 7.5%. I'm gonna skip over this and just get to what's really at stake. So sticking with the idea of spraying, before the introduction of BT um, brinjal into Bangladesh, the farmers there were having to spray their crops every two to three days with really toxic insecticides and pesticides to ensure they even had anything to harvest. Um, the introduction of BT, uh, was it their poor farmers, so they don't have protective equipment, they're hand spraying, this leads to hundreds of thousands of deaths a year. The introduction of BT brinjal meant um, a reduction in pesticide use by 80 to 90%, which has saved hundreds of thousands of lives. There's also some plant diseases for which there are no nature-based solutions. So um, the story of genetically modified papaya in Hawaii is really a, a success story because if they hadn't introduced this genetically modified rainbow papaya, there would be no more papaya there because of ring spot virus. Closer to home, we've been growing genetically modified drought-tolerant maize. Um, that's made the difference between whether farmers have food on the table or not. Um, particularly in the recent devastating droughts. Similarly, in Bangladesh and Indonesia, they've engineered rice to uh, withstand flooding for almost three weeks compared to conventional rice that can only last two to three days. So it's meant food on the table. And I'll end with the story of golden rice because it really is a powerful one. So every year, millions of children go blind because of vitamin A deficiency and hundreds of thousands die because vitamin A is a crucial part of our immune system. We've had a solution for 10 years in golden rice. The rice has been engineered with the beta carotene gene from carrot, that's the precursor for vitamin A. Um, and just a bowl of this rice a day prevents vitamin A deficiency. But we haven't been able to implement it because of anti-GM policies. So I'll leave you with the same question that the Nobel laureates asked, which is how many more pe poor people in this world need to die, be it from toxic chemical poisoning or from starvation or vitamin A deficiency, before we consider this a crime against humanity. Thank you, Laura. Um, I think I will take one question from the audience before we proceed to our next presentation. Thank you. We've been having the debate about GMOs for quite a while. Um, and uh, the question is really, are we winning? Do you think we are making progress by talking about it and by putting it out there and trying to to convey our scientific message? I think um, slowly, I think, uh, I, I can see that there's a push for policies to change. A lot of it's um, driven by Europe, I think, and then, you know, African countries don't want to adopt GM technologies if they're not going to be able to sell their crops to, to Europe. So, 
I think that um, I can I see I can see changes happening there. I think I think that the you know they've made a commitment to be carbon neutral by 2050, and they're not going to get there unless they start changing their policies um, and start adopting GM technologies or other newer technologies as well. So I think we're winning. <laughs> <laughs> slowly, <laughs> very slowly. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Lara. Um, I think what we're going to do, we are going to move on to the second um, panelist, uh, Professor Musa Mashabela, um, who is a, an expert in the public health uh, affairs. And, and we know that the big culprit when it comes to misinformation and this explosion of misinformation infodemics as they term it is as a result of uh, the current challenges we have in the public health system. So I'd like to um, um, invite Professor Mashabella to give us his five minutes of fame. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you so much uh, Dr. Msomi. Um, I think um, I should also just express my appreciation to be here for the invitation. Um, it's an honor to, to share my thoughts. Um, I'll be quick. I, I'm not an expert in misinformation, but I do study health systems, especially public health systems. And um, because we study health systems around diseases, um, we then have to deal with the challenges that come with having to manage those diseases in our healthcare systems. The first thing to indicate is how complex health systems are. And generally when we do science, we want to keep everything else in control and so that we can be able to test whatever question we want to test or whatever hypothesis we want to test. But when it comes to health systems, you've got multiple moving pieces at the same time. When we were doing work around HIV, um, we encountered a lot of uh, challenges when it comes to misinformation. Um, we learned lessons then, and I think in a way we assumed that it will not get worse. It cannot get any worse than what we saw with, uh, with HIV. Um, when we dealt with TB, including drug-resistant TB, we encountered a lot of misinformation. But because it happens in a sort of uh, contained space um, when it comes to TB, then you think that it only affects certain people. Um, some of you may remember the times even around 2008 in South Africa, we, we had patients who did not want to be in hospitals and they had drug-resistant TB. They wanted to go home. They, some of them were jumping fences. Some of them had to get police to go and get them in their homes and return them to, to hospital. Um, a lot of it, we sort of reduced it to people not understanding the seriousness of their disease or not understanding the transmission dynamics of the disease that they had. In retrospect, as we now look back, especially having learned lessons from HIV, we realize that we are the ones who did not fully understand the experiences that people had. And we did not attach enough value to their daily challenges. It's much more important for me, for a patient to complete a course of their anti-tuberculosis treatment than for them to go and look after the kids who are left alone at home. But for them, that's a difficult choice. For me, it's not. It's simple what they must do. Now, when COVID-19 hit, it's almost as if it just took all of those challenges that we encountered with uh, HIV and TB 
and put them and drove them on steroids. Firstly, COVID-19 disease itself came with a lot of myths. And people were just saying, it's not going to affect Africans, it's not going to come here, and a whole lot of myths that came with it. But I suppose the biggest challenge we saw was when we had to treat patients and people wanted to take ivermectin. Everybody heard about ivermectin, even though there was no science that was solid to support ivermectin, but the narrative was dominant, way ahead of science, because science was moving slowly. Science was fast with COVID, by the way, but for the narrative, it was moving quite slowly. Vaccines, when they came, same thing. The narrative that distorted the facts moved ahead of us really fast. Now, we were playing catch on. Now, we also noticed that at the end of the day, it came down to mistrust. There were issues that we were having of people just not trusting authorities, not trusting politicians, not trusting the media, not trusting sources of information. People did not really have credible sources of information. And it affected even the scientists because then the funders of the scientists came in, big pharma came in promoting products. All of these things started to contort the narrative. Now you think of a doctor or a nurse sitting in a clinic or a hospital having to filter all of that information in order to address the questions of the patient in front of them. We quickly realized that even our healthcare workers were getting information from the media. They were reading newspapers because science was being reported in the media faster than the government or the health system could actually produce policies um, or seculars and so forth. But having said all of that, having gone through that whole experience, for me, two things stood out, in South Africa in particular that we did many things right in this country, many things right. But the fact that South Africa did not take leadership in manufacturing a vaccine here, that was one of the first failures that led down not only South Africa, but Africa as a whole. And of course, if you're following the news, you can see that we are trying to correct that. We are trying to catch on with that. But the other thing that we failed on is addressing misinformation. I think we underestimated the machinery that was required to manage information and communication in this country. And it's not just us. Many people around across the world did not get this right. It's not just us. But in general, those are the two things that I feel like we really struggled. And in many ways, I feel like we let down South Africans. I got drawn into science communication because of the clear gap. And that gap, I saw it as early as February of 2020, before we had our first case in South Africa. By, by that time, we still needed to talk about hand hygiene so that we can provide the right information to people. But as I said, when the myths came, they just overtook us. I look back and I think that we think of a disease, we think of the agents that cause a disease, we prioritize that. We prioritize uh, the laboratory testing that we need to do to detect the, the disease, the surveillance systems that we need to put in place. 
at the border, we, the, the laboratory equipment, the, the technical skills that we need to train people in to do the tests. We prioritize the capacity of the hospital to admit patients and manage the disease. But we forgot to prepare South Africans. We, pre we forgot that. And when the case is hit, surge after surge, when innovation hit, one innovation after another, they were constantly left behind. And they had to close those gaps themselves in terms of information. By the time we realized the problem and we tried to fix it, we were playing catch up. But for me, I feel like misinformation really transformed our health system. We've been talking in South Africa for a long time about how we need our health systems to do something different, to not just focus on treating diseases, but to look after people but we didn't really fully understand it. We learned it from HIV. HIV required for us to ensure that there are high levels of adherence to treatment. And because of that, we needed to visit people's homes and make sure that conditions were right for them to adhere to high levels of treatment, which meant that you needed a more holistic approach to a patient, unlike where you just prescribe treatment and they'll sit to finish by themselves. So with HIV, we had to do things differently. We learned from that. And when it came to COVID, we realized that in order to win, you really have to take the focus away from COVID-19 itself and start to focus on the people. When I was then engaging with public communication, science communication, I focused my attention on people, not the disease itself. Of course, you're communicating the message about the disease, but you really have to get your fingers on the concerns of the people. A lot of the times, they have little to do with COVID-19 itself. It's their fears about something else, about their livelihoods, their securities. If you don't address that, then you're not, able, you're not going to be able to get your message through. But I just want to finish by saying my remarks by saying that the health system is having to transform and we are seeing that transformation. And the way it's transforming is that we often look at the health system in terms of just service delivery, health workforce, medical products, vaccines, technology, financing, but we forget about all these other ideas around the role of households in healthcare as part of the health system, as an extension of the health system, the things that happen in the household. Self-care with COVID-19 around ivermectin, it was not happening in clinics and hospitals. It was happening at home, in communities. But we were not necessarily looking at it. The social determinants of health. When someone does not have enough food and you want them to take a vaccine, the whole time you've been neglecting their food insecurity, why all of a sudden you think that I'm going to listen to you? You ignore my problems and now you're coming with your priorities. You want me to jump to take your vaccine? No. For me to take your vaccine, it means that you must pay attention to my problem, which is food insecurity. So if you're coming only as the health sector, you can't address my problems. And if you can't address my needs, then I'm not going to take your vaccine. Then in South Africa, you're going to end up with 50% coverage of vaccines for adults and not be able to go beyond that. Because those who live on the margins of society, those who are disenfranchised and who feel hard done by society or government, they are not necessarily going to engage in what you're offering. It doesn't matter how, whether it's scientifically proven or not. So I think for me, what I'm proposing is that we need to be able to expand the way we think of health systems. We can't really continue to think of them as a way of looking after the disease itself. We must shift away from putting the disease at the center, but put the people at the center and recognize that we need a multi-sectoral approach. This is a framework that was developed by the WHO. We didn't pay attention to it, 
but we are now having to pay attention to it. It's complex, nobody wants it. We want things to be simple, but actually people's experiences are a lot more complex. Let me stop there, Chair, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mashabela. I would like to invite one question from the audience before we move on to the next one. Um, Dr. Banks, I see Dr. Banks has got his hand up. Please bring the mic to him, otherwise you're not getting dinner tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned that we were playing catch up in the information battle, let's say. How would you address that in the future? What would be, what, you know, if we were, let's say we were two years back, what would be your sort of recommendations and priorities for getting the message out quickly and, and not playing that catch up? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important question. I think that uh, firstly, I think we cannot wait for a crisis to make systems available for communication, trusted sources of information for health and well-being, and well-being more broadly, not just in terms of disease only. If you've got existing systems that are there, people know they will be able to count on them. The next thing I think that it's about realizing that when we have under normal circumstances, information can move slowly. Information can emerge today. It can take about three, four weeks, sometimes a couple of months to, to filter down. Usually it's not a problem. But when you're dealing with a public health emergency, information needs to move quickly. And we need to learn how to get information to move quickly through the steps. In South Africa, what we did was to try and centralize command of information. At the beginning, it was good. But as things progressed, we needed to decentralize, and we didn't. Uganda set up a whole national community engagement committee, which was chaired by uh, Professor Omaso, a very prominent person in, in Uganda. In every village, they set up communication uh, engagement task forces, every village. This is what they should have had beforehand, but the fact that they got to that point is something that they must never let go of. And it was an effective mechanism for them to be able to communicate with communities. And communities knew that when they had questions, they can go to those people. And you know, where, the, where you're dealing with people who are disenfranchised, they don't want to get information only electronically. They want to get information from the person because when something goes wrong, either it's side effects or whatever it is, they want to hold someone accountable. And the way we, we engage with, from a distance, it becomes a little bit difficult for, for such uh, layers of, of, of society. But for me, I think that we need to get our communication systems going. And I saw it even with healthcare workers. As I said, healthcare workers were not getting information quick enough. So we need to think about how to build our systems of communication now that we know that we must engage people. But it has to start with us making that decision. If we are still only dealing with diseases and not dealing with people, then we are not going to set up those systems to start with. Let me pause there. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Mashavir. Just by the way that one of the challenges of science communication is that it becomes a members club. If I look at the podium, it's people who are trained in the scientific process. And as a result, it creates the gaps that you have so eloquently, I think both of you have eloquently expressed as to how do you reach out to society? How do you bridge that gap? Um, luckily tonight, we do have somebody who comes from the social sciences who will at least start to uh, assist us in the dialogue on how to bridge the gap between the core sciences, the technical side of things, and 
how that relates to society. I don't know if I'm misrepresenting him, but I'm pretty sure that he will speak for himself and probably dispute whatever I have said. And with those words, I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Rasigan Maharaj to give us uh, his comments. Uh, if you could uh, cross over to Rasigan, please. As this is the modern version of a seance, can I check? Does everyone hear me? Ah, excellent. Can, Thanks, no, for <laughs> Thanks so much, good colleagues. So. Um, thanks for the uh, very kind invitation and provocative as well, Dr. Um, uh Congratulations to ICGB, a very important initiative, and I really encourage uh, uh, that you take this forward. Also to BioAfrica for having the courage to invite me to offer these comments to you. So I have about 16 points to raise, and uh, I'm going to start uh, with a strong uh, uh, point, and I hope it will give you a sense of what will follow. The first point is that an alternative fact is not another fact. Colleagues, it is an alternative to facts. So why I raise this with you is how this notion around post-truth grain the credibility whereby the Oxford Dictionary voted it the word of the year in 2016 is because of our social our, and political circumstances. And very much like some in the audience may remember a 1992 book called The End of History and the fact that we are in 2022 may be facing an end of history, but it hasn't actually dawned upon us uh, should provide some reverberation with what I've said earlier. Colleagues, I also want to encourage you uh, very much, as we all know, and has been pointed out by all the colleagues that have presented uh, so far, information serves a very important uh, purpose in society. But there are two words used to qualify these alternative facts and post-truths. The one is misinformation. And colleagues, it's not an exclusive grab. It's not a monopoly over the term uh, information. We also have disinformation. And it's quite important us being able to differentiate between these. In the first instance, with misinformation, we really are dealing with the product of ignorance. And towards that end, much can be done to redress the situation. As Dr. Msomi knows very well from Noam Chomsky, there's another way of calling manufacturing consent, which is manufacturing ignorance. And uh, that's a means through which control is exercised. Disinformation, however, is an example of arrogance. And that's where Fukuyama's work, for example, the end of history, tried to reshape a narrative uh, uh, that's very difficult to sustain, at least empirically. So on that basis, you know, where we are at present, we live in world systems, not of our making colleagues, but where it actually is today. These world systems, as you've heard from Lara, you've heard from uh, Mosa, uh, from Schlansler as well, we live in a combined world. This combined world is very unevenly uh, distributed. Yeah. Notwithstanding the combined and uneven development of world systems, they are our only common system because of the planet that we occupy. And it's in this context that it's important to note the specter of an ecological catastrophe looms large, colleagues. Yeah. But underpinning this ecological catastrophe are a number of economic crises. There's the corruption of politics, and I'm sure colleagues will know uh, uh, the depth of this corruption uh, and its consequences in terms of the social dissonance. Mistrust, again, may be through ignorance. 
but we do have distrust. And that distrust is actually being fermented for particular interests. So that gives you a context within which I want to focus um, on the role and responsibility of the scientist itself. For all of us as sentient, cognitive, homo sapiens sapiens, we're meant to be the thinking of uh, the last extent of our species. It's very difficult, if not impossible, to reconcile scientific fact with the social arrangements that we surround ourselves with. Colleagues, I'm sure all of you, even though you may be more bio bioscience orientated, know a bit of physics. I know Dr. Mdraka is in the audience as well. How is it that infinite growth is proposition on a finite planet? It's very difficult to reconcile these. And the facts don't match the rhetoric that spins around it. In the current phase of the capitalist mode of production, the contradictions are becoming larger. The notion around the trickle-down spread of benefits cannot be sustained by the evidence that surrounds us. You know, uh, Mosa, as you spoke itself, it's odd that I didn't hear the word vaccine apartheid being mentioned, because that's the way in which world systems also prevents an even or equitable distribution of the benefits of science, the benefits of knowledge, the benefit of trusted facts. So within this and responding to these contradictions, there is really a need for us to respond to. Uh, you know, earlier I heard when Laura was speaking as well, the notion of why is it in Bangladesh that uh, uh, the situation uh, got as uh, crisis prone as it is. And an answer to that is not necessarily only commercializing or making available commercial products, but actually building strong, resilient national systems of innovation, which are Bangladeshi in nature, which bring together necessary scientific and technological competences to serve the purposes of the Bangladeshi society. We have to be very careful. Corporate state capture is what uh, gives us the form of corruption we are immersed within at the moment. And asking for more of that as a way forward, for me, is very troublesome. We are at a point in our own evolutionary history where global citizenship, in fact, may be coming more and more of an immediate need rather than longer term aspiration. The parochialism uh, of petty nationalisms and the comprador states leaves little to be desired for all of us. So in responding more broadly to the theme and topic, Dr. Msomi, I want to really emphasize that the possibility is not about trying things that we have done previously but failed, but rather for us to embrace the wider opportunities that are in front of us. Science for the people, by the people. And through this rebuilding trust in public goods and services. For this, as Professor Morosa has pointed out, public participation and engagement is critical. In fact, that forms the basis upon which everything else becomes possible. And public participation cannot be separated from public accountability of the scientific enterprise itself. You know, in South Africa, and in particular, our own situation, we speak about systems, whether it's health or otherwise, that in a generation, now nearly 30 years, we have not managed to achieve a people's orientated dispensation. We've called for decoloniality and decolonization of these frames. And in this, we must also really pay attention to redressing the epistemicide visited upon all of the global South in their insertion into this unequal world system. Colleagues, it's really possible for us to consider them yeah, an alternative. And an alternative in this is against hegemony practiced through the narratives Dr. Nsomi quite clearly pointed to. 
A global knowledge commons is what has helped us in our seven million year pathway to sitting in that nice venue in the southernmost point of Cape Town at the moment. This global knowledge commons faces an incredible threat. And that threat is from its enclosure and appropriation for private profits. Hmm? We've got to really be serious about pushing back against the commodification of the very essential humanitarian basis that allows us as a species to have thrived and created the institutions that we are party to. So, colleagues, when we face these facts, it's really important to look at our own praxis. What is it that we are doing that extends the misinformation and the, and the way in which we propagate disinformation? Should we be true to the research, we would also be able to present to people real alternatives, not alternative facts, but facts to bolster an alternative way of looking at the world in a more egalitarian, shared, and communitarian fashion. Thank you very much, Dr. Msomi and colleagues, and greetings from the city of Tswane. Um, can I take a question from the audience? If there's one. Um, hmm? So, Dr. Msomi, there is a question on the chat. Yeah, I'm waiting for it to be posted to myself so that I can exercise my powers. <laughs> These powers are not permanent. <laughs> it says, what role does uh, indigenous knowledge systems have? Can I exercise my power, please? Okay. <laughs> As I requested. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming, it's coming, uh, Rasikan. Uh, it is a life sciences event, so we are excused from, for being, uh, yes, because we evolved before technology. Okay, so I have a question from um, what I've got a question from somebody called Bua Prof Maharaj. What role can indigenous knowledge systems play in reducing hunger? Um, I'm sure it's, it, it, it's up your alley. Uh, what role can indigenous knowledge systems play in reducing hunger? A comment on that, please. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and thanks also, Lebohang Elita, for asking the question. You know, this is so significant because it's also something I'm sure the colleagues in the audience also are aware. South Africa has um, emerging and evolving and developing indigenous knowledge systems uh, policy process. But within this, us grasping the history, the history of the peoples of the territory and how a sustainable settlement was possible prior to colonization is a very important factor. We will live now in a world where we have a monopoly of particular crops, particular animals that provide us the basis of our nutrition. I'm sure all of you colleagues that are involved in this work directly also know that we do produce sufficient nutritional value currently to feed more than the 8 billion people that are on the planet. We have to ask ourselves why that's not the case. And towards this end, in redressing that, if you'd excuse it, colonization by crops and the animals we've domesticated, is the role played by indigenous food. And here it's so important, when we look at what it is that we are growing and how we are extending uh, and putting un uh, under the plow uh, a land to generate uh, food, who is this food for? And what crops are we actually planting? The role of sorghum, the role of millet, the role of a range of uh, crops and products that may be better suited to our space in this, uh, Southern Africa may have a huge role to play. 
but it's also then redressing epistemicide, our ways of seeing the world that were destroyed by the way in which we've been inserted into world systems. So I think there's absolutely a role for IKS. IKS is being promoted by the Department of Science and Innovation, but we really need to now start seeing the products of IKS embrace our whole science system so that the colleagues that are working on more advanced tools and techniques available to us currently are also able to enjoin themselves with those traditional knowledge holders and improve information that is available. This is the type of us working together. This is the type of cooperation the type of collaboration that's necessary. If we were merely to compete against each other, we're competing to death, colleagues. And that's what looms ahead of us. We really must embrace more of what we have around us. Like I've said initially, science for the people, by the people is possible. And that's why we need good public goods and services. Colleagues, we must be investing in our public science, technology, and innovation systems. I'm really concerned that the level of funding made available to the system is decreasing and is decreasing at an accelerated rate. This puts us all in mortal danger, at least thinking-wise, about the future that's in front of us. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Rasinga Maharaj. I think the last... Um, um, presentation or commentary will be given to us by Dr. David Paho, who will um, at least try to tie up the conversation by discussing how to break the misinformation cycle, particularly tools for distinguishing between facts and fake news, seeing that we have been talking about facts. Uh, for the past hour or so. Over to you, um, Dr. Paho. Uh, thank you, colleagues. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Musomi, and, and thanks so much to the ICGEB and BioAfrica for this kind invitation. Uh, colleagues, I'd like to share a, a presentation, if I may, and then uh, I think that will anchor our conversation. Please uh, tell me if it's, uh, it's visible. Colleagues, can you see the presentation? Yes, it is visible. Thank you. The, the, the mandate I got, and thanks, uh, Dr. Musomi, for, for, for making me anchor the graveyard shift in the conversation. Uh, but I think the, the, the conversation that uh, 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 is of importance, uh, uh, as Dr. Musomi has alluded, is knowing fully well that we are uh, amidst a uh, an epidemic of misinformation. How do we how do we stop the spread of fake news? And 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 to that effect, uh, we know, and I think the previous speakers have have highlighted that scientific facts matters. And I like what Dr. Uh, 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 Prof. Vasigan uh, uh, highlighted that also we have to give people alternatives, but these alternatives should make sense to them in their particular environment. So. I thought, let me just start with some fun, but really false facts, which um, have pervaded uh, through the course of time. And Prof. Dr. Musomi had highlighted that, uh, you know, fake news have been with us uh, for, for a much longer time than we can uh, care to admit. Uh, the whole notion that if you drop a penny from the Empire State Building, it can kill you if you are on, on the sidewalks. That glass is a high viscosity liquid that lightning uh, never strikes the same place twice, which we know is untrue, but people still believe it to this day. And even more importantly, which is something that uh, when I ask a number of people who are in the science field, they still believe that the Great Wall of China is the only man-made object visible from space. And all these, I know they are, they, are, they, are, they are not necessarily significant in the bigger scheme of things, but it just shows you how once an idea, a fact has been inculcated in the minds of people, it can, it can be very difficult to, to counterpoint uh, uh, and in some cases to very disastrous effects for, for the communities. So I just thought 
within the context of the whole misinformation um, epidemic, uh, uh, as, as uh, Dr. Musomi have highlighted, we should first look at what what good is there in the world. I mean, in we have huge media choices in in this century, cable news where you can have access um, in real time. Uh, within a few minutes of Will Smith slapping Chris Rock. Um, every individual on this planet who have access to cable TV, so the visuals, we have access to electronic media so that you can have access to uh, uh, some of the best newspapers in the world at the click of a button. The internet has opened huge doors for people to understand what's happening around the world. But also even more importantly, the advent of social media have been a boon in terms of our access to information and worldwide connectivity. All these are important as part and parcel of uh, human development and innovation. But having said that, uh, there is a, a bad element to it, obviously, because we have a situation where because of access to internet, to social media, everybody's an expert. We have a situation where we have fragmented and polarized media environments where anyone can claim to be an expert while disseminating falsehood. We've seen it quite unfortunately when it comes to the issue of vaccines and the huge implication it has had in terms of, of the devastation uh, uh, around the world, even in uh, advanced economies. So the societal impact of, of, of the access that we have to, to media, whether it's social media or the internet, is that there's an increased likelihood of misinformation and fake news, which is basically the core of today's discussion. There are no longer trusted gatekeepers who curate information for accuracy. If you go back in time, you have an editor who will make sure that the newspaper uh, uh, stories are accurate. And if there is an error in terms of the reporting, there could be a retraction by the newspaper. But now in the golden age of the internet, uh, any person can post information and, and that could not be curated by any uh, uh, reliable source, and the information can be taken as a gospel truth. Even worse is what it has given rise to. Uh, the access of, of information on the internet, social media, has given rise uh, and proliferation of hate groups, cults, criminal syndicates, uh, the dark web, which has had profound uh, impact on, 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 on society in terms of, of the rise of, of hatred. Uh, uh, especially amongst minorities, uh, uh, both um, on the African continent and beyond. So uh, uh, we've had great boons in terms of innovation, which has uh, really opened doors in terms of access to information, but it has, has unfortunate uh, 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 repercussions in terms of what it has led to, the rise of, 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 of uh, groups um, and formations which are not in the greater interest of our society, especially within our progressive uh, agenda worldwide. So I thought I could just highlight two important uh, uh, examples of how misinformation uh, uh, have really led to devastating impacts uh, uh, both here and in other countries. I mean, the first key example which you can all relate to is the whole notion of the, the, the impact of, 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 of uh, uh, condom misinformation on the uh, HIV in at least in South Africa and beyond. I mean, the myth and misconception which has been spread is that HIV has been manufactured to reduce black African population. Condoms were infected with AIDS worms. AIDS is caused by supernatural forces or witchcraft. This unfortunately has resulted in less positive attitudes about condoms, less belief in condom effectiveness and HIV prevention and lower intentions to use condoms. And the societal impact as part and parcel of, of, of our discourse today is that HIV infection rates have increased in spite of wide availability of condoms and scientific information on how the virus is spread, uh, resulting in a strain on already fragile healthcare systems, especially in developing countries on the African continent and beyond. Obviously, this has led also to avoidable illnesses and deaths, uh, uh, which, in effect, if we could have combated the misinformation uh, and, and some of the myths, chances are it could have made a, a 
big impact in terms of the number of people that we have lost to illnesses and death as a result of HIV infections and related uh, uh, afflictions. The second example, which is more uh, 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 pertinent also in terms of our discussion uh, 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 the past two or three years, uh, it was driven by the, the uh, Andrew Wakefield, uh, who basically published a paper in Lancet where uh, uh, the scientific uh, studies which have been shown to be fa fabricated uh, claim a, a, a non-existent uh, a, a link between uh, the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine and autism. Uh, I think this has had a huge impact if you think about it because the publicity around the 1998 studies has caused a sharp uh, decline in vaccination uptake leading to the number of outbreaks of measles around the world. And obviously this is part and parcel along with what has happened with, in the COVID environment of uh, a, a development of vaccine hesitancy through, throughout many countries. So again, colleagues, it just shows how uh, devastating misinformation um, can be uh, for, for societies and the long-term impact and not in terms of, 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 of death, but also in terms of diseases which can be prevented uh, uh, proliferating specifically because people have been fed uh, false information. Those two examples, as depressing as they are, colleagues, highlight the importance of the conversation we are having today as to how do we, as scientists, uh, as science communicators, um, policy uh, 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 makers in every single country on this planet have to make sure that we counteract the spread of misinformation uh, 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 so that these things can be um, uh, circumvented. So the question that uh, Dr. Musomi has posed is that how do we combat the misinformation scourge? Uh, for specifically for scientists, I would like to uh, uh, recommend the following, which even in my space within the university that I, I work for and within even the communities that uh, uh, I'm engaging in and living in, is that we have to speak out when, when we see false information and be proactive about it. The whole notion that you know, uh, 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 people who have no business uh, pontificating about vaccines have an upper hand within social discourse should be uh, counteracted. Uh, and then it's the responsibility of scientists and, and all the relevant stakeholders within our communities to do that. We have to make sure that we correct, provide and exhibit the right information through legitimate mass media, public debates, radio, and legitimate newspapers to ensure that people have an understanding as to where we are going. I mean, to our credit, the, the South African government and other governments around the world have gone out of their way in a COVID-19 environment to really educate people in terms of uh, how the importance of vaccines uh, uh, to health, the importance of washing our hands, the importance of using uh, sanitizers. I think this kind of drive, obviously we could have done better in this space, but I think the responsibility is to make sure that we correct uh, uh, and then provide the right information to all people in all corners of the globe to ensure that they make the right decisions in terms of their well-being. I'd like to tongue-in-cheek say that maybe scientists have to go out of their way to popularize the three most important words in the English language. Wait a minute. When somebody provides information you are not sure of, we have to ask people, we have to inculcate that mindset within our people uh, that they have to start asking questions and if they're not sure, find a way to find uh, uh, the right answers. And I think that will go a long way, colleagues, in creating an environment where people can become more engaged in matters which affect them. The other issue is that as scientists, we have to stop uh, uh, you know, coming at a very high level in terms of articulating issues. We have to make sure that we present facts in layman terms as much as possible and wherever possible, even if we have 11 official languages in this country, we have to make sure that every single language every single way of communication is uh, uh, captured so that all the people who have to have the relevant information get it in the way they can understand. The other issue which is also very important and we've seen it also within our universities that when we did surveys about a uh, vaccine uh, 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 hesitancy, 65% uh, of our students, undergraduate students uh, uh, have shown tendencies not to 
want to get vaccinated and other things. And we've realized that we have a huge gap as uh, 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 my colleagues have, have highlighted to make sure that we especially focus on and advocate for education of young generation, inoculating uh, them against fake sciences. I think that is something that we have to become more proactive with, even uh, in a post COVID-19 world, we should not relent in terms of making sure that people, especially young people, understand the science, understand the science of viruses, understand the science of vaccines. The most important issue, which I think we could do is also is to make the facts more compelling and interesting interesting than the lies or fake news. And I think I like what uh, 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 Professor Maharaj have said, that is we have to create narratives which people can understand. And, and I think that's a very important uh, uh, take home for all of us in terms of how do we handle misinformation uh, within our society. The other thing that we have to do is we have to make sure that we promote curiosity within the citizenry where people I encourage, as I said, to ask questions and engage on matters which affect their well-being. It's all well and good for us to disseminate information, but we also have to start empowering people through the media that is available to us to make sure that people start asking difficult questions, even when we know that uh, 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 the, we have the truth on our side. It's very important that people start as asking very serious questions. And that's part and parcel of empowerment of our citizens, that they have a right to ask questions to get the right kind of information at the right time. The other issue, which is also quite important, is to spare debates in all forms, uh, within our churches, within our uh, uh, political formations, within our universities, to spare debates to enhance public understanding of science. And finally, again, tongue in cheek, we should all maybe deploy Higgins raisin, razor as an integral part of our scientific discourse, but can be asserted without evidence, can also be dismissed without evidence. I think more often than not, we allow uh, the false news, the false narratives to take precedent and without us questioning people. I think now more than ever, we have to engage in scientific discourse, but we have to make sure that the burden of proof for falsehoods lies with the people who are spreading this. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dr. Paho, for some practical tips and tools on how to combat uh, misinformation. That was very insightful. I would like to invite one question from the audience, please, before we get on to a free for all. Um, any questions directed at Dr. Paho? Dr. Paho, I see you, you drew the jackpot. The PG himself. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, uh, maybe I'm jumping the gun. I don't want to ask the question to David, but I'd like to ask the question to ourselves. Uh, so when we listen to the four people who have spoken, have we really asked the underlying question, why do people embark on their misinformation? Do we fully understand that? I don't want to leave here with a sense that it's because of ignorance. I think the topic is much more complicated than that. And I'm going to illustrate this with one or two examples. You started off, Dr. Msomi, by reminding us about the Galileo announcement, one of his discoveries was that the world was not flat. Yeah? Now, if you think of the time in history when this was being discovered, it was in the time of the Roman Empire and the interface of the Roman Empire and the church and how the Roman Empire thought that by having church as part of its empire, you can control, you know, how society, and therefore if you have somebody who 
begins to come with things that are not in line with the standard narratives that must be crossed. So that, that was a state-sponsored, if you like, attack to the science. Right? And therefore, it's slightly different than, for an example, a situation where Musa, let me take my hat off as somebody who's trained scientifically and put my hat as somebody who is a climate change activist who says, it's actually the science that has put us in the problem we're in in the world. It's the discovery of the steam engine, it's the discovery of electricity, and all the greenhouse gas emissions, the transistor and everything else. Now, that's what I mean by two examples that says, we, before we conclude about this misinformation and science, I think we need to understand what are the drivers for people to embark on this because they are saying, you can't trust the scientists in the climate change examples. They are the ones who are responsible for this. Um, you can't try and play God, Laura, by starting to interfere with the genetic manipulation around food because you don't know the long-term consequences of that. You cannot, as a state, allow people to change narratives that you need. In order. That's what has uh, 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 Rasekhan's point. So I would hope that this is not the end of this conversation, but, but we begin to nuance the conversation so that by fully understanding the drivers and, the, and, and, and reasons why people embark on this, and my sense is it's different reasons, uh, we, we, we can easily uh, stay on the um, on the periphery and on the uh, on something that I have learned recently, which is called talking on averages. And they say that's very dangerous because an average means my head is in ice, my feet is in the fire. On the average, I'm fine. So I just want us to just keep exploring, you know, the full aspect of why this is the case. Thanks very much. Thank you, DJ. I would like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Razika Maharaj to respond to some of the DG's comments, especially around who controls the narrative, and with particular reference to Noam Chomsky's manufactured consent. Because when I, we started the conversation, we said we're anchoring it in structure by Thomas Kuhn, and Noam Chomsky to manufacturing concern, but maybe Dr. Maharaj, if you could just take over. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, and thanks for also for the question and comment that you've posed. I really hope also we take to heart uh, widening the discourse and engaging with more people around these issues. Uh, Phil, as you well know, um, the steam engine applied to particular industrial processes is a phenomena we identify with Western Europe at a particular point in its history. We also know that the steam engine existed before that, but was not applied for the same industrial and commercial purpose, which benefited those that owned capital. And this is quite an important point in Noam Chomsky's work, explaining how we could have an apparition of war in the context of the knowledge that we have available to us, speaks particularly to the interests of the military industrial complex. That's what he was studying. I mean, he's a linguist as well. It's quite important drawing this out. Yeah. But when he draws on this, he points to the role played by those particular interests in capturing what you describe as the state. In other words, capturing government, which then acts in the purpose of further extending uh, the advantages and the benefits accruing, be more precise, Phil, accumulating to those that own. And this remains a critical issue for us today. We have a lot more opportunities other than just feeding that machine. Technology is created with people, for people, for the purposes of resolving real and uh, prescient challenges. 
I don't think carry the same um, uh, uh, negative significance that could be attributed to those building empire or establishing, maintaining, and extending hegemony through their praxis itself. We have a lot more available to us, colleagues, when we look at world history, but world history not written from the Mediterranean, but written from world systems, we'll find many insights that help us understand how important science is for us presently and what it is that we can do to engage with that for a better future. Colleagues, otherwise, we're staring down catastrophe. And as you said, wearing the hat of a climate change activist, we really have to be concerned. This is the only planet we have, colleagues. And unless there's some really massive technological breakthroughs that allow us to escape gravity that holds us down here, uh, we all better make the planet work. And I'm convinced science and technology will play a key role, but not in its corporatized enclosed and privately appropriated system at present. Thank you, Dr. Mson. Thank you, Dr. Maharaj, and thank you, um, Dr. Mjuaha, uh, for those insightful comments. Um, as a hired gun, it's my displeasure to call the meeting to closure. Uh, and I think as the uh, DG pointed out, it's the beginning of a long um, series or of a series of dialogues that need to be taken up. Uh, and we thank the ICGP for the science of the city uh, uh, concept. It's something that is uh, long overdue, particularly in our context, especially because we do also need to discuss issues that talk to um, Global South and the context of the Global South as far as science and innovation is concerned. And we're very, very, very grateful to, um, to the ICGP and the Bio-Africa Partnership to bring this to our shores. And I'm hoping that we will have one with Claudia's permission uh, in the next few weeks or the next few months uh, to continue this conversation. Um, and I've been told to stop talking. I was kind of hoping, I was, I was hoping I would have two hours of nonstop. And I would like to invite everybody to a small bite. Apologies to those of us who are joining us virtually. We will be um, sending virtual uh, glasses of wine and some snacks, <laughs> virtual ones, uh, and we'll continue the conversation um, um, in the next room. Thank you. And please give yourselves a very warm round of applause. Again, I would like to thank all the panelists and, in fact, everybody who had the time to come and join us. As uh, Dr. Musomi said, please help yourself, and uh, I encourage more discussions. We have uh, grab a bite to eat and a glass of wine if you drink. And again, thank you very much for coming here today.